Hello, everyone, and we are so glad that you are joining us today for this very special program where we are joined by Jason and Lisa Frost. And my name is Andrew Mack, and this is Elena Mack, and we are in Berlin, Germany. And as you know, our new album, Cyberpunk, has uh, been out, and we are so excited for that. And some of the themes with the album pertaining to the digital realm and being stuck inside of digital devices and the digital world and breaking free from technology. So many of the themes over overlap with a book that Jason and Lisa have written called The Glass Between Us. And so we're going to be having a conversation with them today about their book and hearing from them. And so we are just very excited that they are with us on this uh, on this program today. So welcome. Welcome. What an honor to be here. Thank you for the invite. Such an honor to be here. And of course, I couldn't say no because Andrew did pick me up at the airport before he even knew me. I think it was like you had to get up at what, 3.30 in the morning to take <laughs> us to our 5.30 a.m. flight. Because so, all of our stuff couldn't fit in one car. Was that? Oh, no, we didn't have a car. That's no, why. we didn't. That was the problem. We didn't have a car. So Andrew <laughs> rescued us. <laughs> I remember. And that's actually where I first was able to meet you and hear about the work that you are doing and to find out about the book. And uh, I read the book and it was so impactful. And that's just why we knew we need to uh, talk with you and share about that to all of our listeners and our audience. Oh, man, it is total <laughs> honor. Thank you so much for having us. Well, let's just get right into this. And my first question, and we can open this up, and maybe you can also um, introduce yourselves a little bit if there's anything you want to share about yourselves. And then what would you say is the motivation behind writing this book? And tell us a bit about the book. Yeah, I can, I can go ahead and get started. If yeah, go for um, it. So we both worked with kids, actually it started out in Germany, then we ended up also working with kids in the United States because we are actually a German American couple. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were working in the school system, we we're like, man, this, this glass that we are talking about in our book, um, the, um, the glass that the, the devices in their world is totally impacting them. And I was, I remember a moment where I was, um, I was meeting with a couple of students and um, it was pertaining a sexting, sexting issue where somebody had sent an intimate image and then it got passed around the school. And then I found out that that girl was actually suicidal. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, is this because of digital media or is this because she was already having mental health issues? And I realized this is issue is so much more than just a few pictures on a screen. And that's what really brought us down the rabbit hole, if you could say, of the next five, I would say five solid years of research. It took us about three and a half years of researching for the book. We wanted, whenever you talk about kids and sexuality as a, as a major part of the theme um, in digital technology, everything needs to come from a foundation of truth. And even though, um, you know, we know from a biblical perspective, what a lot of the answers are, we wanted to share with the world what we call God's design mm -hmm. and share more about how mm -hmm. this is affecting childhood development and where it's leading to and how we can take a stand right now to raise up this generation to mm -hmm. be one of the most successful and powerful generations of our age. Uh, so that's really where it all came from. And we ended up um, studying. Uh, I did my master's in international law with a specific focus on children's rights. Mm -hmm. And we, which the master thesis uh, laid the foundation actually for the book. Uh, and we combined all of our stories and all of our experiences working with kids with this underlying rock solid foundation of research, mm -hmm. which then led to a, uh, the foundation of our organization, Wired Human. It's a nonprofit that stands to protect kids mm -hmm. from online exploitation and to give parents and schools tools to raise up this generation successfully in the digital age. And from there, things just sort of grew feet and took off. And we've been trying to keep up with it ever since. But mm -hmm. really, the mission is, is that we see this generation as the future problem solvers, and they need to be equipped and fully ready to mm -hmm. take on the challenges of our age. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, that's, wow. that's really great. So 
where are you actually located now doing this work mainly? I mean, I know you're in the U.S. and also Germany, but you are coming back to Germany now, I, I think, is what I understand. Yeah, we are. We do a lot of traveling. So we the the nonprofit is based in Nashville. Mm -hmm. We are expanding uh, the work into Germany as well as a German American couple. It's something that has always been in our heart and was actually mm -hmm. founded into the DNA of the nonprofit when we registered it. And we will be making regular trips to Washington, D.C. to do our advocacy work, but also uh, to Nashville and across the U.S. to be speaking in schools and different mm -hmm. arenas to share the message that we have of empowerment and, uh, and ultimately courage to parents and encouragement to kids to mm -hmm. tackle this, this problem. What is super interesting is that what we found as we were researching for the book and talking with kids, interviewing them, um, gathering their stories, um, we found that the issues that kids have across the globe are so similar these days mm -hmm. because they are all on the same devices. They follow the same influencers. They play the same games. They even play them together. Mm -hmm. And so generationally, we are probably further apart from this growing generation because we didn't grow up as, with devices the way they did. Mm -hmm. Then they are apart, even though they are geographically hundreds of thousands of miles apart. <laughs> mm. I mean, one of the things that really stood out to me when reading your book was the impact um, that digital devices, apps, and just phones, smartphones, um, the internet in general is having on interpersonal and particularly romantic uh, relationships. Mm. And I wondered if you could share with us um, some of those impacts and just really how devastating mm -hmm. um, the impact is on, on young people, but really on all of us mm -hmm. when it comes to those types of relationships. Mm -hmm. I actually just, just had two stories pop up in the last couple of weeks with, with some parents that represents thousands of other families out there uh, that I would like to share because I think it highlights this. And one was a, a dad that talked about his son that was in a romantic relationship online with a girl. I believe the son was a, was between 14 and 16, somewhere in that age category. And he had grown in a relationship with a young girl. And after a while, she actually sent him a nude, which is very common in our day and age and said, what do you have for me? And in that context of intimacy that he had developed over months, he felt safe enough to send something back to her. And the next message he instantly gets is get your dad's credit card and go online and buy these gift cards and send it to this address. You have one hour, or this is going to go to your youth pastor, your school, your grandma and grandpa, your siblings, your mom and dad, everybody that I have networked myself to you over this time period will receive this content that you just sent me. And it's devastating because oftentimes kids then will immediately respond to that. They'll, they'll get the money and think the problem solved, but the message that comes instantly back is now send me 2,000, you know, 3,000, 4,000. It's one of the leading causes of suicide among teenagers. Mm -hmm. And then a, another side note to that is I just spoke to a dad that talked about walking into a room. I mean, an amazing father, Christian father that walked into a, a room and his four and eight year old were watching pornography on his cell phone and they had picked it up from their young uh, relatives that had taught them where to find the content. And we're just realizing now, and as you said, you know, my first smartphone exposure was at 25 years old. I'm 34 right now. So that was nine years ago, but kids, it's the big experiment. They're growing up with this technology omnipresent in their lives. And <laughs> what used to work for parenting, what used to work in the school system, what used to work at a legislative level doesn't work anymore. Mm. Mm. And then if you think about the world that they are engaged in, we have to realize it's not necessarily our world because we, I'm assuming that some of us here listening are older, not, not my world. Um, and what I mean by that is that if we see what they're immersed in, in their friend group, it's like, there are certain values that, that dictate how they do technology. Oftentimes it's show your skin and you're going to get followers, like look as sexy as you can, have a trophy girlfriend that looks awesome. <laughs> um, it's, it's just values that don't necessarily equate to good friendships, good relationships. Um, 
and in, in fact, hijack them. And then another thing that we have noticed is that we have a massive loneliness crisis, especially in the United States among youth. It's absolutely off the charts and it's also being fueled by anxiety and depression. And we say that the smartphone, it's like if you give a smartphone to somebody that's lonely, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. Hmm. Because it doesn't actually bring us closer together at an intimate level. Mm -hmm. Instead, it gives us all these lives that we can look at all day long and it never stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think like one of the things you mentioned in the book was um, just the extreme nature of content that's able to be found Mm -hmm. on the internet. Mm -hmm. That's really not, um, it's just accessible so easily for any age group mm-hmm. and yeah. how the brain or even like the emotional or mental like capacity to comprehend what is being viewed is not there, mm-hmm. which obviously that would not be good for anyone um, to be engaging with that content, but especially for underage people. Um, and that there really is like an issue with the technology companies or mm. um, did not want to uh, control that because of the, financial gain that they are getting um, from underage people. But could you just talk a little bit about uh, the impact on the brain, Mm. on Mm. the physical functioning of a human um, because of this continual like engagement with content that is Mm. quite extreme? Uh, I'm going to like try not to explode here because this is like one of my most passionate themes. So you guys hold me accountable Mm. to like 30 seconds. So I don't (laughs) drive everybody crazy. But I'm just going to take this cable here. And what we have to realize is in childhood and adolescence, that 90% of addiction to alcohol and drugs, 90% forms before 18 years old. And it's because the brain is responding with hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions of neurological connections that it's hardwiring together And it's also deleting and getting rid of completely. And what it's doing is it's forming these connections and preparing a child and an adolescent to have their go-to snap to responses for adulthood. And it's like super effective. You know, if you think about back in the day when a bobcat would jump out, you know, you saw the scratches on the tree, you smelled the, the scat on the ground and, you know, all of a sudden comes the bobcat tearing out of the woods. Well, the next time you see a scratch on the tree or smell something, you're already headed in the opposite direction. It's going to save your life. But in the, the technology companies, they have essentially tapped into the primitive function of a child and adolescent brain, even our own. And they're lighting up that section of the brain with low hanging fruit. We like to call it, which is sexuality, shocking content, fake news, drama, emotionalism, which is what the adolescent and child brain is only capable of thinking through everything runs through the emotional brain the logical contextual side of the brain hasn't fully developed till 25. so what you end up having is a generation that is getting exposed to all this stuff and it's a grooming process we like to call it in preparing them to become the ultimate product and customer of the tech industry for the rest of their lives. And it's so Mm. effectively working right now Mm. when in the United States alone, that kids before COVID were spending between seven and 11 hours a day in front of screens. And that since COVID has only gone astronomically higher. And then it's no surprise that you hear all these tech companies that have gone upwards of 200% in profits and value Mm. over that timeframe. It's because it is incredibly incredibly profitable. So yeah. So when you talk about sexuality, when, when they're seeing stuff online, a lot of our older generation thinks, oh, they're going online and they're looking at, you know, girls in bikinis or, you know, what you would even call it soft porn. But what they're actually getting, a child is getting is they're getting market value. Market value is somebody who's been addicted to pornography for 30 years that types in naked sex, topless, And they're not getting those things. What they're getting is the market value of how do we continually hook this 30 year veteran of pornography and keep him going. And what he's looking for at this point is exploitation, trauma, and things that are, are, are going to keep his brain active, um, to counteract, um, the desensitization of his sexuality. 
And so that's what kids are immediately exposed mm-hmm. to as their baseline. And that changes everything from that point on Yeah, on and- the way they approach relationships, the way they approach life, how they feel about themselves. Uh, it, it is completely a traumatizing experience. Perfect example is Billie Eilish. She spoke up the other day. Um, many of us know her through her music. And she was like, I cannot believe what pornography did to my brain because she got exposed at 11 years old. She kept viewing this stuff that's oftentimes super violent, super um, demeaning towards women, um, often abusive. And she's like, I let men do horrible things to me. And it was because pornography was telling her, this is okay, this is okay. So she's actually experienced trauma in a real life relationship or not even a relationship, some kind of sexual encounter thinking this is how it's supposed to go. And only years later, she's waking up and being like, oh my gosh, like it hurt my soul. It hurt my body. I have all this trauma, but I didn't realize it until years later. Mm. And we can multiply that by millions, really. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say that each of us can do and any of us in any um, age group um, anywhere across the world? What could we do as an individual to help with the reality of, mm-hmm. of these issues? Great question. Yes. We need to get real. <laughs> we <laughs> cannot sugarcoat things mm. uh, and we cannot dance around things. And here's the funny thing is our generation has a problem talking about sexuality. And what I mean by that is we get in front of a room and we're immediately like, oh, I got to be careful what I say. I got I to gotta frame it in sort of a soft way. And the reality is, is that over 90%, if not more of the kids and teenagers you're talking to are consuming pornography, which means all the stuff I just talked about is very real and normal part of their life. And what they need to have is a healthy version of sex explained to them, something that drives purpose, something that drives deeper meaning, something that gives them a goal to shoot for, but more importantly, um, explains very clearly what the natural consequences are. So we always talk about in our book, we, we talk a lot about neuroplasticity of the brain, which I kind of described a little bit, but ultimately where that leads to, we interviewed Gabe Deem. He was uh, on the Oprah Winfrey show. He did uh, interviews for Cosmopolitan and he was in this position because he was a young guy in his early twenties that had been watching porn since he was 12 or 13 years years old. And by the time he was a young man in college, he was completely incapable of having sex. He couldn't have an erection. He couldn't have any functionality of that part of his body didn't work. But if he touched a laptop and opened up the screen, he instantly got an erection. He was instantly capable of entering into that intimacy, but with pornography. And he realized in that moment, and and the story is actually really beautiful because where it ends is he realized porn blew up his life it screwed it up and he went on a journey and found hundreds of thousands of men in the same boat as him, Mm. started an organization to get healthy and brought all these men together to start talking about, hey, we got to start fasting pornography. And over two years of fasting for him, he said he was probably the most severe case you could have found. He ended up breaking his addiction to porn, marrying a gorgeous woman who's the love of his life, having children with her and living out the best version of his sexuality possible. Mm. And he said, I went from being this, you know, he called himself, Mm. I was trying to become a sex God and I ended up becoming a libido zombie. And I thought that was a great way to put it. And he brought himself back to restoration. So when we talk to kids and I love what Gabe, Gabe does, he walks into a room and he says, hi, my name's Gabe Deem. Uh, a few years ago, I used to have a limp noodle and had no ability to experience sexuality at any capacity. And here's my story. And this is how I got healthy. And I think there's something very motivating with kids and family when we say, Hey, I'm not telling, because a lot of our parents, at least in my generation grew up saying, don't do it because it's wrong. That doesn't really work today. You have to say, don't do it because this is what design looks Mm. like. This is Mm. why God loves us. This Mm. is where he wants to bring us. This is what healthy sexuality looks like. This is what love in a context of relationship looks like. And this is more importantly, this is what you're fighting for. It is a war zone out there. And if we're not preparing our kids to put on the armor, we're not preparing them with the realities, then they are going to go and they're going to get blitzed by an enemy they didn't know existed. So we have to, Mm. we have to be really real and clear about what we're talking about with our kids and earlier is always better. And th- there's definitely different ways you can talk about it between ages, but, but that would be the most important thing. And 
we have we have a model that we call less later limits so what we have to realize is tech right this is an amazing tool and it's also ridiculously omnipresent so they will have it around friends they will have it in their schools they will have it on their walk to school they will have it everywhere so we can't we can't control their world and that that is why what jason is talking about digital mentorship is so important and we owe that to our kids and oftentimes as parents we are so on the spectrum of either feel like oh this is freaking me out or it cannot be that bad and we're on that other other end because Either way, it's overwhelming, right? Um, and we didn't want this world to look like that, where there are no boundaries online, <laughs> where kids are not protected. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 the reality. Like they are in Las Vegas trying to find, figure out their way back home and they are getting a little lost at times. Mm -hmm. So the sweet spot is the digital mentorship spot. It's the spot where I'm like, I trust you. I trust you even when you go online. But we also have to put some healthy boundaries around it. So mm -hmm. before we give anybody, you know, advice, a personal device, we need mm -hmm. to know, we need to prep them. We're like, okay, we'll do it slowly. We'll do it in steps. And what we also have to realize is that kids, they respond through their emotions. So if a child has a phone in their bedroom at like one in the morning, it's like, oh my gosh, I could look up all this stuff. <laughs> but if we say, hey, in our family, we don't have phones in the bedrooms. Um, and we as parents don't do it either because maybe it will hurt our love life <laughs> as an example, right? Mm -hmm. um, it makes a difference. And that's where we have to say 10 conversations before 10 years old, at least hitting on the harder topics. Um, and then being there on their side as they journey into adulthood and really taking time. There's nothing lost in introducing technology slower. There might be the discussion and arguments, but the kids that we talk to, they often look back and are grateful for, mm -hmm. for the boundaries that they were once wrestling with with their parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really the core of what's in our book is the uh, what we call the RUM model. And I'm not going to get into it on this interview because it would take too long, but it's re relationship, understanding, mentorship, and boundaries. And it's a journey we walk parents through, we walk teachers through. Mm -hmm. And our ultimate goal is we're not professional parents. We just know about digital technology and we're trying to take and leverage what you do best as being a professional parent, having relationship with your child and walk you on a journey to be effective in mentoring them in, the, in a world that we all are just trying to catch up to and mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't feel wow. guilt. Don't feel shame. It's not your fault and it's not the kid's fault either. So they shouldn't feel guilt or shame. Mm -hmm. If we can remove shame and guilt from the equation and meet yeah. each other human to human, we are all making mistakes. We are messing up. We are spending too much time on our phones. It's going to work out okay. Wow. That's, that's amazing. So could you just tell us a little bit about um, the nonprofit and if there's anyone that would be listening that would be interested to get involved or engage with what you are doing in the nonprofit, could you tell us how we could do that? Yes. I think we both probably have a different nuance on how we might explain <laughs> you that. Go ahead. Uh, we're always excited to get volunteers that want to dive into helping us produce content, helping us with social media, uh, helping us at, social with, media for good for social media with, for good <laughs> and getting that's good. where the kids are, right? Uh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> and exactly. <the> parents. <laughs> and advocacy work that we're involved in; um, those are always you can. One of the fun things about our organization is Lisa and I. Our main goal is to be accessible. Hmm. It's it, we see ourselves as really servants in this whole thing, and we want to serve and we want to come low and we want to get underneath and support you and create a baseline. So uh, just reach out to us. Uh, it's our first name, Jason or Lisa at wiredhuman.org. And we would love to start that conversation or just support you on your own journey. Let us know what you're dealing with. Let us know how we can mm -hmm. help. Uh, but the organization really stands to protect kids. And we try to do it in a unique way where it's not just about a list of uh, rules and how to lock down all the phones and everything, but it really is through a mentorship mindset. And everything we do is centered around relationship and building a core, because what we really believe with the organization is that when kids are trained, 
when kids understand, when they know what their goals are, they know what the why behind what they're doing mm. is so much more effective to rejecting pornography than don't do it because mom and dad said it's wrong or don't mm. do it because it's bad. Mm. And mm. so that really is the center of what our organization stands to do, whether it's their speaking, uh, whether it's through the training material we're putting out. And then the other side is we really try to support legislative uh, issues that are um, empowering parents, uh, holding big tech accountable and bringing a voice to children. And so we really feel that kids have a voice in this matter. Parents have a voice in this matter. But really, all as we hear is what tech, tech, big tech companies think about what should be done and how it should be done. And so our goal is to build a platform for kids and parents to stand on lift them up, put them in front of politicians, put them in front of world, the world stage and let them share their story because mm. they're the ones that are dealing with the pain. Mm. They're the ones that are dealing with the consequences. And they also know parents know what they need. So do mm. kids, they know what they need because yeah. they're in this world every day. And they're like, I wish I had this protection. I wish I had these things. And so those are the things we're trying to engage mm. in as an organization to and, fill that wow. space. Just just to bring some hope too, we live in an interesting time where people are waking up and we are seeing legislative change, legislative pushes in the US that we haven't seen in the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. There are two things um, that will go uh, before Congress in the next few months that are that might might get passed and they are there to desire to protect kids mm -hmm. and to to put parents back in the driver's seat. So we are super excited to lend our voice and then also um, ask families and kids to join because ultimately they will be a part of the solution. Kids Absolutely. will be a part of the solution. They know the shadows, but they can also see the light. We are convinced of that. And the last thing I'd say, if you have a sphere of influence that you want to make technology a discussion, and we just had um, one of our core partners is somebody who has a sphere of influence in DC, and they're putting together a congressional roundtable to invite these kids that we're working with and from schools across the country to come and share their stories and share their needs. And that's really where we see uh, grassroots change taking place is people who have these influence, who have the sphere mm -hmm. of being able to plug them into the voice of kids and families and have them represented, um, represented in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. And I think also <laughs> on the website, there's like free resources mm -hmm. and different content that people can download. Yeah. And there's also uh, the possibility to order the book on Amazon, many different platforms. And so from myself to all of the people listening, I would definitely encourage you to check out their website. What is it again? Wired Human. Org. And on that note, free book giveaways are so cool. I'll leave it up to and Andrew and Elena to figure out how you guys want to do that. But just send us an address of whatever does way you desire. And we'll, we'll send out two books. So give us two addresses and Woo. they'll show up at your doorstep. You guys decide how that's going to work. All right. Well done. Get that moving. Uh, we want that message out there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and we are hoping to have the book in German at some point too. So <laughs> yeah, so Super. if you're a great translator in German <laughs> and have more patience than we do to do it, <laughs> we're, we'd we're love to hear from you. House. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jason and Lisa, we can't thank you enough for this time. And it, it's even just great speaking openly um, about all of these topics. It, it's really, really fantastic. And we're so excited for everything that you're doing. And we love you so much. And we're so thankful we could have this time together to share and talk. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you. thank you. It's a privilege. We'll see you in Berlin sometime soon. Yes. yes. Can't wait. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.